Bo and Luke Nation, welcome to this episode of the Bo and Luke Show. We are super excited to bring you a fantastic guest. He happens to be a former colleague of mine from the White House days. And you know what, Luke? This is just going to be fantastic because we know there's energy, there's passion, there's just so much good stuff that our guest, Atlas Altman, retired Air Force colonel, uh, you know, just brings so much to the table. He's a best selling author, he's a TEDx speaker. Uh, international award-winning leader. And we're going to talk a lot about leadership because he has a book. Um, it's called Rule of Three. And since this goes out on YouTube as well, let's put this up here so you can see it. The Rule of Three. I absolutely love this book. Um, it's to the point, gets right to the meat of it real quick. And there's so many relevant, uh, relevant things that Atlas talks about in this book when it comes to leadership. I use them and I can see everywhere that they fit, right? And I don't know if that's, and we'll get into it, Luke. I don't know if that's the military background and that he and I share that all this comes from that we really would love to see uh, exemplified in corporate America, if you will. Um, so listen, without further ado, Atlas, welcome to the show. How you been, buddy? Thanks, Bo. Yeah, man, really good. Before, Let me correct some haters because they're going to hate on me. Um, so I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel cause I just got tired of the bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you can save the bird. It's for the birds. Um, but yeah, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and now I, I still, I still like to serve. Uh, I have been listening to your show and let me tell you, you guys push the envelope in the right direction. The one, let me just, let me just give a shout out, uh, to you guys for this one because it's changed my perspective so much and it's, uh, burnout. You guys mm -hmm. had a guest, I think, last year, and she was like, burnout's not real. And I was like, thank you. Thank you, it's not. And I was like, <laughs> totally. I'm stealing yeah. that. I mean, borrowing it. I mean, I'm going to take it somewhere. <laughs> um, and, I, and I just got so excited to hear that episode and then a whole bunch of other episodes. And you guys are pushing the envelope and making people think. And that's what these award-winning podcasts like you guys own, that's what you guys do for the world. And it's so powerful to be out there forever and evergreen saying new and challenging things that actually work. So, um, yeah. man, I got goosebumps just being on the show. And it's so glad to, I'm so glad to connect with, with both you and, and Luke. And uh, just talking to Luke before the show, we have more in common than I realized. He's got guitars in the back and uh, just amazing uh, the way, the way we're, we're going we're gonna to have an awesome show. I can't wait for this. That was, that was yeah. the best entrance to the Bo and Luke show I think we've ever had. Yeah, we'll cut amazing. that up. I'm pumped That'll go to out have there. you on here. <laughs> it's coffee. Yes, yeah, it's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> let's give Aaron Whitehead credit because it was episode yeah. 136. Yeah, She's an Aaron, executive yeah. coach, helps physicians. And yeah, that was a powerful episode. We thank, we thank you for, for mentioning that. I'm sure she'll, yeah. uh, she'll appreciate that for sure. Yeah. So why don't you um, start us off, Atlas, with just telling telling our audience just a little bit about your background and, yeah. and even how you got to where you are today. Now that you're retired and you're speaking, um, what's happening? You know, how did you get there? Yeah, man, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be the ending and that's the spoiler for everyone. All right. So uh, I grew up uh, in, a, in an army uh, brat type of scenario and we're called brats for a reason. It's because we're always uh, the the last person to get picked, and then the first person to make everybody mad because we're actually athletic. Uh, that's how my school <laughs> journey went when I was a kid, uh, and I went through a whole bunch of states, and I learned different cultures and and how to fit in. And the whole childhood journey is in is in my TED talk. I, I talk about it. My mom pushed me into a lot of different environments where she pushed me to grow, and she was my first life coach before that was a thing. And so I had that. And unlike a lot of moms, she wanted me to be in, in the army specifically. She was like, hey, you're going to be a Green Beret or a Ranger and you need to learn all this leadership stuff. So she pushed me around a lot of the special forces, including the guy I call my dad who adopted me at five. He was in the special forces community. And so I grew up around this knowing where I wanted to go because well, my whole family's done that. And mm -hmm. if you go back into my bloodline, actual... I have, uh, you know, this whole thing that I'll expose a little bit later, um, where I was talking to uh, my, I have a red beard. If you're not, if you're listening, I have a red beard. So this is going to tie into this. 
my bloodline goes back to Ireland and I found out that my family was a bunch of pirates and smugglers and yes. they used to fight alongside kings and fight against kings and they were kings, right? And this is all part of a branding thing that I just discovered, talked to Dublin a couple weeks ago and I, I was uncovering things in my family and now they have their own uh, whiskey line uh, that nice. has my, my, my family tie in there. <laughs> it's just amazing how much I've uncovered. But all of this goes back into... Like my family is a bunch of fighters. So yeah. unlike a lot of moms, my mom's like, Hey, you're going to fight when you grow up, you're going to lead on a battlefield. And then my dad was like, Hey, don't, don't go on the army. <laughs> <laughs> so unlike, uh, Simon Sinek, my, my mom was like, you know, here's your why you're going to be in the army. And my, my dad was like, but you're, you're, you're a who you, you probably need to go into the air force because the job that the air force is currently offering you is killer you need to go hmm. in the air force and so he's like i know you're you're an athlete you're smart you can do all the stuff that the army wants you to do but the air force is probably the right choice and i listened to him and uh yeah i went in there made my mom mad she was furious and uh and then you know 27 years later i went from zero stripes and being enlisted up to being you know the fifth highest rank from the top you know yeah. uh so they call us the senior leader. When I got to that senior leader point, I, I was just done uh, with the things. And I retired actually three times from the Air Force. The first time I was at JSOC, uh, we, were, we were doing this little family thing where my wife at the time had a cancer battle going on. And uh, yeah, so moved the whole family over there. And then uh, the second time was when I was in Afghanistan uh, doing a special operations director job uh, mm -hmm. when, when Trump was like, hey, we're pulling out. And I was like, nah, we're not. And then a couple <laughs> weeks later, I'm like, shoot, I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, hey, this is not, I'm not going to get any better job. And then my, uh, my marriage fell apart. And <laughs> I was like, okay, well, uh, I'm done. And the Air Force is like, well, since you're done and you're getting a divorce, how about we give you one more job closer to your son? And I was like, you guys know how to pull those triggers, don't you? Yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. <laughs> they do. So I retired, uh, I retired last year out of being like a deputy mayor. And then, you know, all that last five years since I, the time I hit go, we've been talking, Bo. I'm like, how does yeah. this work? How does the transition work? What should I be doing? What should I be focused on? And he, you're like, well, I've been talking to Luke and we're doing the show. And then you're like, hey, I published this book and like, it's a good book. And I'm reading your book. I'm like, this is awesome. And so I pulled <laughs> some of the stuff out of your book into like to structure some of my book. And then I published a book. And now, you know, I've, I've done a, a TED stage. That's the world's biggest stage now. Uh, my book's a, a 12 time bestseller, the latest one I just published. Thanks, Bo, for some of the tips that you didn't know you gave me. And then um, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote four other, other books with my kid. And now I'm just on this journey to go from a, a servant leader into being a leader servant. And how I do that is by just basically giving away everything that I learned because that's what you do. <laughs> that's what you do, right? <laughs> yeah, man. So that's today. And yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. this is amazing. This is yeah, amazing. That's the, that's the best part of the show is just learning, learning of others' journeys um, throughout life. I think it's pretty fascinating for sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's a long yep. share. Sorry to your audience, man. But let's no, talk more good. about me. I like that. Yes. Yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> That's the uh, whole point. Yeah. Listen, you have, um, there's something in your book. I want you to define it for folks. You mentioned it in the intro because I think it's, I think it's really, really important. And this okay. applies, I think, to anybody in any level of leadership. If you can grab onto this rule and, and how you can um, influence the people that you lead quicker yeah. and faster and get them to grab onto concepts that you're talking about, it's the rule of three. Mm -hmm. So can you define that for our listeners? Um, yeah. What that means to you? I love that. Yeah. Rule three. That's the book that just it went, went off the shelves. Um, and it's still available and I still have it priced at 99 cents. I don't think I'm going to change the price because I just, I want people to have it. It says this, you're all conditioned to think in threes. So as a leader or as a parent or as a teacher, if you give, those that you're trying to influence more than three choices, they're just, they're not going to do any of it. 
They're, they're just not. Yeah. People can, can handle three and four is a sales pitch. So if you want to uh -huh. over deliver, then you give somebody, I can do this, 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 and this. And they're like, wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot because they're conditioned to think in threes. And it starts as, as kids, we start looking at the world in threes with fairy tales and stories. So Goldilocks has three choices, three times before three bears show up and then the end, right? Everyone lived happily ever after. And then sports, you know, how many strikes until you're out? You know, you yeah. want to win a basketball game. How many, uh, how many, how many uh, layups you're going to do? You know, you're going to hit it from the three point line. You know, there's three parts to a hockey game. There's three teams on uh, a football team, you know, special teams, offense and defense. So we start to really compact that into our lives. And then politicians use it all the time. But we saw this a yeah. lot when we were in the White House. Every speech was delivered with, I'm going to do this, this and this and then move. And then this, this, and this. And then people are like, I really like this guy. And if you do three things three times in a complete sentence format, mm -hmm. you can make a powerful speech happen because people will relate to something in there. And it just seems like you're pulled together. So yeah. for me, uh, those three things that I found in leadership are uh, people, time, and money. And I made, them a, uh, I made them a 3M acronym in the book. And it goes manpower, number one. It's the longest word. Uh, moments, second longest word, very important. And then money. Um, the longer the word, the more important it is for the structure. It just makes it easier to remember. But like, honestly, you can't lead anything but people. So we shift focus, especially today, from people into tools and technology and stuff that people have to deal with. Right. And then we go back to people because people have problems with whatever we introduce. So that's kind of the rule of three and how it's employed today. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I have, I have a whole way of how most people approach that. Yeah. And you, you know, Luke, think about things. that. And for people listening, like maybe you just want to hit the pause button for a second and, and just think about, right. Get, you know, get a piece of paper and a pen and write down everything that's impacted your life. That's come at you in the rule of three. Right. Yes. And how powerful that is. Right. You got the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, the NHL. Learn your ABCs. Right. It's all yeah. it's all rule of three. And companies that have taken that advantage of that, you know, Nike, what's their motto? Just do it. Yes. Yep. Right. The Bone Luke Show. Be no do. Right. Mm -hmm. That's our that's the model. That's the Army NCO leadership model. Be that's no it. do. Right. It's the rule of it's the rule of three. Yeah. If you can just grab onto that and kind of use that as your framework, man, it's so powerful. It is. So it's, it's why uh, it's, it's neuroscience. It's why phone yeah. numbers are divided into three, three yeah. groups. You ever wonder why yep. it's impossible to remember. Try dividing it into two. There's no way. Right. Four. Yeah. Uh, uh. not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Magic number no, in math is 3.14. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there you go. It's that's how everything is. That's, that's how we figured out that the world is not flat. That's right. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it gets across the greatest point here because it doesn't some, I don't want to say the message doesn't matter because the message does matter. But what matters more than that is that people remember it and that right. they can retell it. And yeah. any more than three, they're not going to be able to do that. You know, so if yeah. you're, I'm in sales, I stick to that exact same thing. I'm like, I could put in 50 bullet points. Now nah, we're going to put in three because no one's going to remember any of the 50 that I put in. They won't even remember one. No, um, military. Won't. I don't remember who told me this. I read it in a book somewhere, probably stole it from Simon Sinek. Who knows? But it's, uh, <laughs> it said, uh, when the military, when military leaders, uh, present to, you know, the troops, they say, we're going to do three things. We're going to tell them what we're going to tell them. Then we're going to tell them. Then we tell them what we told them. And that, <laughs> that just resonated yeah. with me. I'm like yeah. in sales. All right. That's what I'm going to do in my presentation. I'm going to tell you what it's going to be about. Then I'm going to tell you Then I'm just going to tell you what I just told you. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's cool. Exactly yeah. how we're taught to give presentations, isn't it, Bo? Yeah. You know, and, and it, 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 it was <laughs> right. It works. Think about in business, right? What do businesses have? Every business should have three things, mission, vision, values. Yes. Right. And, and tie everything else to that. Right. It's it's just super powerful. Right. And I love we got to go through this phrase because I think this is super important because even I've, I've gotten this wrong in the past. And, and when you mix it up, you'll see why it's wrong. You mentioned in uh, rule number one, uh, Atlas, that um, people. Right. 
It's yeah. people, people first, mission yeah. always. You can screw that up and say mission always, people first. You discuss that in your book, right? Yeah. I 100% agree with you. People first, mission always. But I think we should give some some explanation as to why that's important. Yeah, absolutely. You can't have a mission without people. There, there is nothing in the world that happens because it happens. There is a reason, and it's always a person that's being helped, improved. It doesn't matter what it is. People help people to make the world a better place. And when they don't, and they focus on mission, then people have people problems. And when people have people problems, no one does anything. Because no one moves past the people problem. They always want to talk about it and get through it. Because we are conditioned to be together, to work as a team, to work as a company or a corporation. And the easier it is for us to communicate what that is for people, how we're mm -hmm. helping people, uh, the easier it is to move out. So yeah, my, my next book is, is Start With Who for that reason. is yeah. because people... Mm -hmm go off on all these tangents and they don't realize as a leader and a decision maker, because that's really my forte, my niche is decision making, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. leadership decision model starts with the person. So there's 18 different decision models, 18. You know, Harvard boiled it down, to, I think four. No, they went to three. They said the, a leader should make decisions on uh, HBR review in uh, performance, uh, process or people. And they said it in that order because, oh, well, I think people make decisions that way. They're like, if if, it's, if there's a problem in front of me, how can it be fixed? And they say, well, if they're worried about money, they're like, how much does that cost? Yeah. Uh, and then, and if they're worried about how quickly they need to get back, like if it's a car and it's their only car, they want it back as fast. They're like, how, how much time is that going to take? Right. Instead of looking at the most important principle, which is people, you yeah. know, if you find the right person, you are going to save time and money because they know what to do. Right. And we so, so, so fall into the trap of trying to save money, trying to save time. And then we hire the wrong person and we spend more time and money trying to figure out what it is we just did. And yeah. it's always right. The crux of the problem It's always people. So uh, that's why I emphasize people first. Because whenever you start focusing on the mission, which is time and money focused, then you lose the bubble and you don't move as fast. And I've seen it fail yeah. multiple times for other organizations whenever my organization's focused on people. I mean, Bo, you know this because it mm -hmm. took, what, a year and a half, two years to get into the agency? Because mm -hmm. they were focused on bringing the right person in. Yeah. Not, not saving time or money. They're, they want the right person in the agency. And they don't yeah. want anybody just working around the president. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, that What's was the program that I run was that I ran or headed was bringing the people in, right? Yeah. And it was yeah. never about speed. It was always yeah. about the right person, finding the right person, the best person for the job. Take what time it needs to take, right? Because everybody's different. Everybody has a different background. So you have to take that time. And if that time meant, hey, maybe you need to do another assignment first and then come to us, well, then let's put in the time to do that, right? Yeah. And you can have something to work toward and we're not going to forget about you because um, you're you're the most important piece because the president is important. That's a person. Like, why are we doing this? We're not doing this for a building, for the White House. This is for the president, right? Mm -hmm. That's a person. Um, I like, even in, you know, through the show and our platform, um, when you think about, you know, that concept, people, people first, mission always, how many times... And everybody listening, man, just think about this. How many times have you been on the phone or you're talking with somebody at a store, retail clerk, somebody who's trying to help you and they get stuck and the answer is, well, the computer won't let me do it. Ooh. And it's like, you know, and I, and I, and I will look at them very politely and I'm saying, are you in charge or is the computer in charge? <laughs> right. True. Does the computer, it's just a thing. It's an object, it it's a right? You're a person. You have way more importance than that computer. Right. So you got to do something with that. Yes. Right. Maybe the computer's broke. It has a has a bug. Something's happening. Right. But but you can't let the other person that you're looking at and talking to um, 
get the get the bad end of that deal. No way. Got to always always people first. Well, I, I get why Harvard is doing it though, because now that I'm like working this through my mind, like the right answer, the trump card to get this done and have success is people. We all know that, right? However, I've noticed as I get older, like good people, people that are really good at what they do, like just absolute excellence. Like the difference between great and excellent is just such a vast difference yeah. that is not only, <clears throat> excuse me, tough to find those people, but to invest them to get them to be excellent takes forever. Now, there's a lot you can't control in that aspect either, and it's a long-term ROI. Now, look at performance and process. I, I can get some quick wins off of performance and process, but you look at like if the sea level is coming in to make a change, you got what, one, two quarters tops to show that you're actually steering the ship in the right direction or you're out on your can. So I get how, I guess I can empathize why they do it, you know, but it's just the dichotomy is the long term way would actually work. And yeah. then companies just don't want to so, pay people what they're worth. So then there's so that. let's, so let's run with that example. Cause I think that is, I think it's a, a good example, right? So you, you're the, you're the CEO coming in, you have two quarters to try and write the ship, yeah. right? And, and you look at it and you're like, well, we're not performing, right? So should the CEO go find the who? I, I would be hard pressed to believe that everybody's not performing, right? There's yeah. got to be your elite players. And this kind of goes yeah. to Atlas to one of your tags about be elite, right? Yeah. yeah. Who are the elite? So the first thing I would think my proposal would be, I'm going to find that team that's elite and get them involved. And we're going to find out how we, how we write this ship. Yeah, I just pushed this out any, to Leif any Babin. Any comments? Yeah, Leif Babin and Jocko uh, Willing yeah. wrote a book called Extreme Ownership. But Leif Babin's quote is, there are no bad teams, only bad leaders. That's right. Mm. So I threw that back in his, his court yesterday, I think. Uh, he pushed out something and I pushed it back. And I was like, hey, you're absolutely right. Remember, the quote is this way for a reason. And it is so true. If you have an underperforming team, it's because of the leader. I'm sorry. It just is. It, it's always the leader's fault. So if you are not meeting your numbers, if you're not making the marks, let me explain to you what multiple billionaires have said in public and in private. People are the crux of success or failure. And mm -hmm. if you're not looking at them and not, not replacing them, you see people either change or you change the people. And people have a problem changing the people. And that will hold you back every time. The leader is making it happen or it's not. So if you jump into a C-suite position because the organization has been failing, you better do a leadership assessment. You know what I would start with? It's free. Love languages. Mm. I'm going to blow your mind with this. Uh, so Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. Mm -hmm. And I, I read it uh, when I was doing marriage counseling and I was like, this is leadership. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, uh, like I know there's the five love languages are uh, physical touch, acts of service, words of affirmation, uh, gifts, and what is the third? quality time? Mm -hmm. All right. So most people in the military are words of affirmation people. If you say, hey, man, you're doing good. You recognize them when most people don't. So that immediately sets you aside and gives you that Maxwell point, right? Which is Maxwell says, people don't care about how much you know until how, they know how much you care, right? So right. if you're if you're recognizing them and they're like, oh, this dude cares, bonus points in the military. But your organizational culture is different. If you're in uh, the service industry, gifts might be the thing that people are going to resonate with. Uh, if you're in the service industry, physical touch might, you know, touching them on the, on the arm or in podcast being like, Hey man, and then showing your hands. Uh, it's just, it's something that people resonate with because high fives are proven to bring out the pheromones as yeah. people strive for. So yep. uh, find out. That's a great language. analogy. Yes. Yeah. And then look at them as a leader from their love language and you'll be able to communicate with them a lot easier to see if it's something that they can tweak or if you just need to change out the person. Yeah. Think about sports, how that works there too. Oh yeah. Coaches coach smacks you on the ass, you know you just did a good job. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. that's touch, right? So I, yeah. I think that that is a great analogy. 
I well, it that. all depends on what his why is. So, you know, let's go there. You know? <laughs> yeah. well, well, why are they playing sports to begin with? You know, let's 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 jump into what 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 is your why? You know, when you're a professional football player, you know, you know, it all depends. Yeah. No, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> That's the stupidest a little like... thing ever. <laughs> and le- yeah. leaders eat last. Oh yeah, is that is that right? They're they're making angry decisions because they're hangry. Because they didn't eat, but everyone else ate, so they're able to do the angry thing that they just now decided. No, that's not how it works. It's like, <laughs> I am so angry with the way we have set this up um, in the last you know decade, especially, where we're listening to people who don't have the experience uh, tell yeah. us how, how we're going to do that, you know? And yeah. That's a great and point. It's everywhere, too. Did I just open a door? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think it's an important door because, and um, whether you talk about it passionately or there's, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But we've talked about this um, yeah. uh, on this show with with others, right? Because when you're on when you're on social media, right? Everybody's everybody's a coach. Everybody wants to be a coach, yeah, right? Do. And so many people go down the, the wrong the wrong rabbit hole, if you will, mm-hmm. because they're selecting people who they like on social media. Yeah. Right. Versus doing the, doing the deep dive interview with whoever you might hire to be your coach to yeah. ensure, I'll just put it like this, that they've been there, done that. Mm-hmm. And they actually have experience that they can draw upon to help you because you want to, whether it's the same industry, same line of work, yeah. whatever it is you want to achieve. Right. Um, cause, cause you could spend a whole lot of money I, you could waste a whole lot of money um, <laughs> if you're listening to the wrong yeah. person or people. Yeah. So the leadership problem is a yeah. $1 billion a day problem. $1 billion yeah. a day is spent on trying to figure out how to make leaders better. And it'll never be solved because everybody is different. And yeah. we're focused on processes or performance instead of people. And when we do that, when we come up with the the, the newest thing, like I came up with something that's super easy for you to grasp, but you can turn it into whatever it is that you want to focus on three things in your life. And I guarantee you those things are going to happen. But if you yeah. really want to expedite it, uh, start with who, who are you? You know, if you focus on one thing, people don't really start to drive success in their life until they figure out who they are. And that takes mm-hmm. time. And if you're not dedicating that time and you don't know who you are, everyone sees it everyone's not, yeah. you're not going to, you're not going to get leadership that way. That's just not how it works. So $1 billion yeah. is spent every day on leadership, trying to figure out how to make it work. And the easiest thing is, is start with yourself, man. Who are you? You know, who are you really? Yeah. And what are your strengths and weaknesses? And, you know, I, I, I redid SWAT in the book there. Um, mm-hmm. I don't believe that SWAT is a thing, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I think it's SWO. I think threats are opportunities just waiting to happen. Hmm. You know, yeah. if you don't have competition, which if you break down that word, what does competition mean? It means that you're in collaboration with someone else to make each other better. That, right. that is competition. So if you're not in competition and you don't know who you are, you're not going to progress as fast as, as you want to. So I do a new thing called targeting instead of goals and and affirmations and like new year's resolutions if that's still going on for you whenever you listen to this those are all stupid (laughs) when when i'd go to the range i'd make noise that's what i do right as a uh air force guy i was a communicator right and they changed the title to whatever it is today uh and they tried to operationalize it and i was always at the range i just want to make noise as a communicator how can i make noise so I'd make gunpowder in a noise. And what I'd do is I'd get on the range. I had a range officer or whatever. I'd set up a target. That target was my focus. And guess what? I always hit the target. It's amazing. I always mm-hmm. hit the dang target. So uh, if you put up a target in your life, whether it's on the mirror, in a book, whenever you take it out of here and you make it real, you focus mm-hmm. on that one thing, it's going to get done. So there's a book called The One Thing, aptly named, right? Uh, yeah. The one thing says this, one thing I pulled out of that book is you spend 33% of your life changing between tasks. So if you're looking at your phone and then your computer and then the movie, which is the cycle a lot of people do at night, <laughs> yeah, you're spending 33% of your time 
not being entertained. If we pare that down to 25%, let me put this in context. That's one week out of the month, you're not doing anything but switching between tasks. That's four months out of the year that you're not doing anything but switching between tasks. Now, let's compound that. Four years out of every decade, you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything. So if you focus on one thing, just that one thing, you're going to knock out all of that percentage. You can bring it down to below 25, and you'll actually be more productive in life, and people will ask you questions like you guys get. How do you do it all? Well, I focus on my family for a little bit, and then I, I focus on my work for a little bit, and I focus on improving those around me because if you're part of a winning circle, you're going to be a winner because that's mm -hmm. how life works. So that's the new targeting model that, that I employ. And the small businesses that I work with, they see a lot of value out of that because it, it gets rid of all the crap that's in there, you know? Yeah. It's, that's, what, that's what it is. And that's Great. what it's all about. You got to get rid of the crap, the distractions, yep. right? Amen. If, if, if you accomplish that and get some focus, wow, it's a different world that you live in. But we're, we're, all, we're all told, you know, we have to find our why, you know, so... You don't. Yeah. It, it comes. Yeah, it doesn't. There's lots of whys. There's lots of why. It doesn't. I, I'm a huge fan of this atlas. I in the past year I've started distilling some in my own mind, and now I tell my coworkers because I mentor a few people this. I'm like, your job description is one sentence. I love it. It is to bring in X amount of dollars of net new revenue to the company. All the other junk you're doing, that's it. All nobody cares about the other stuff. That is your only job. Yeah. That's your job description. Well, yeah. it includes all this other stuff and updating. It doesn't like you're, you're just, you're, you, that's not your job. Your job is just to, we're in sales to bring in money for the company and that's the goal and that's it. So what are we working for towards with that? Right? Yes. Atlas, why do you think, why aren't leaders teaching mindset better? Because I feel like all of this comes uh, back to like, we give the people the tools to make their own plans. Yeah. Have right. We had an NFL player on and we said, you know, what's the biggest lesson you learned from Jim Harbaugh, you know, he said battle rhythm, but basically it all come, came down to mindset. He learned mindset from Jim Harbaugh. And now he's in yeah. the NFL. Like why aren't leaders doing this? I think they think that everyone knows what they know. So everything that you require from anyone that works for you should be at the most simplest form. I like your one sentence, but a lot of people don't realize that the most elite teams they go off of one word. Like really? the Super Bowl, you know, what does the quarterback say? You know, one word and the ball gets snapped. Don't know what that yeah. word is, right? But one yeah. word. On uh, special operations, I'm not saying anything classified here, so the haters are going to come out. <laughs> but <laughs> they always do. Whenever I talk about my time in uh, in, in and around elite teams, they're like, well, you're not a, a, a trigger puller. I'm like, yeah, but I, I pulled triggers. I just never had to because we had experts that did that, you know, so why would whatever I was not an operator or an operative. I was a leader in the community. And what I heard whenever things were happening was training being executed. When training gets executed, that goes off of one word, execute. So when they say execute, the mission starts. Everything that they planned for goes. When the quarterback says hut, hut, hike, or whatever the word is, Everything yeah. goes as according to plan. The mindset behind that takes time. And the mindset that a lot of people think their team has, they don't have it. They don't have it. So they say the word and they're expecting a result when nothing came out of their head to tell their team what to do. They didn't practice it. They didn't execute it. They didn't say hut, hut, hike. They just said, hey, I, I need you to do this. And then read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and whenever there's yeah. a problem, it's like, well, what's wrong, dude? You're a terrible leader because you don't know how to communicate. Make it simple. Make it one to three things. If you do more than three things, they're not going to do it. But if you do just that one, what is the most important task today? Right? We're we putting out yep. fires. Are we putting out fires, or we're we making a fire station so we can put out all the fires? Yeah. You tell me today. What are we doing? Because I'm gonna do it, Chief. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I love yeah. it. I, I listened to one of uh, Jocko's. So Jocko's podcast, if listeners, if you hadn't listened, you should. They're like four hours long each, so yeah. it's kind of a commitment. But uh, he was talking about plans for teams and like why leaders fail. And he's like, 
your plan fails with your team because yeah. it's your plan. You know, and that really, that struck a chord in me. And he goes, you know, think about it. It's nobody's invested in your plan. You have to have them come up with a plan. It's probably yeah. going to be similar to yours, but plans need to change. And he's like, if you give them a plan and say, I want you to do this, when something changes, they're going to go up. Oh, Luke, I bet you didn't think of that, did you? But if it's their plan, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're going to they're going to go and change it themselves and like of course they'll tell you the plan and you can give feedback or whatever tweaks you want to, but you know, hey, it's a good plan. Go do it. it what kind of, you know, results are you going to get off of that that somebody that's passionately invested in their own freaking plan? So true. In business though, we don't do that. We're just like, here's the plan, here's what I want you to do, here's the parameters and do this every day and people are like, "What?" <laughs> yeah yeah it's not good well you learn more personally from bad leaders whenever you're talking about them behind their back <laughs> <laughs> well i'm never gonna be like that guy <laughs> he just yeah. told me exactly what to do and now he's micromanaging me and like it he can't he can't control us all we're not puppets so we're gonna fail and that happens often like people just like I'll never be that guy. And then they grow up and be that guy or gal, whenever yeah. it depends. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. They do. And then it's like the, it's a, a switch is flipped mm. and they just become that. They, they just slide right into that role overnight. Just. <laughs> yeah. Our yeah. actions make people like our actions that, that, that we do as the people that have made it, they're being scrutinized at a level that most people don't realize. So when you make a decision based off of a plan that you came up with and you don't share it with everybody, I mean, he's talking from experience, right? We all did that. The first time we were given a task, we wanted to be the hero. So we ended up figuring out how we're going to do it because we were put in a position because we're good at our jobs, not because we're good at leading. So whenever we figure out what needs to get done, we say, this is what's going to happen. And then when they don't do it like we're going to do it, then we get mad because we didn't communicate with them, but really it's just because they don't know how to do it. And yeah, leadership one-on-one, man, that's like, don't give them, don't give them yeah. a plan. Tell them what the outcome needs to be. Yeah. You know? Yep. I've experienced, I experienced that actually my first time. Cause I, I had two different tours at the white house, but in the first tour, um, I was still enlisted. Right. But the, the warrant officer that I reported to taught me, he taught me all of that, but in, in just his interaction with me, I learned, yeah so much about leadership right because alice he'd call me into his office and you know the office there in the j1 which yep. became my office later in the second yep. tour it's a big right? office everyone right. <laughs> huge office, he'd pull, office huge office he'd he'd, <laughs> hand, he'd 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 pull out a piece of paper just a plain piece of white printer paper yep. on his desk and he'd be and he called me bo he'd be like bo listen and he'd start drawing right there there might be three images yep. And, and it's like, I'm trying to figure out what are you drawing, right? But he's drawing and talking, but probably only gave me about 10% of what he wanted. And yeah. he did that on purpose. He knew everything that he wanted, right? But he didn't want it to just come from him. Yeah. He's like, okay, now take this and go, go figure out what we're going to do about this, right? And yeah. I kid you not, man, that empowered me so much. Yeah. I would go come up with something. I would talk to other people. Hey, this is what Chief wants. You know, let's, what can we put together? Blah, blah, blah. And then we brief him and we probably had a 90% solution, right? Yeah. And then yeah. He, he put in some tweaks, give you some feedback. Yep. That's the extra 10. Now you're literally briefing the commander, right? And you have ownership. Yes. You were a team. You're built everything built in, built in yeah. right? Yep. And what did he do? All he did was give us the opportunity to, to come up with the plan. Yeah. He had input, of course, right? Yeah. But it wasn't his plan wasn't That's just right. him it was the whole team that, man you want to talk about results i could I'm go sure. on all day about the types of results right the, the ownership um, there just amazing it's amazing and, and the build he's building so that's, that's what people fail to realize it's not about you never is it's never about you but if you can build somebody that's better than you you win yeah. <laughs> that's, that's oh 100 percent, right you win yeah so like why are you gonna hold hands and have a bunch of kids in your court and people do this. They are like, Hey, I'm, I, I'm really busy. Why are you busy? <laughs> why, why, aren't you a leader? And they're like, yeah, but I got to what do you gotta just give it to them. Let them figure it out. 
they're going to give you something probably better than you come up with. It's true. If you just let them. But you, yeah. you know what? I'm going to say something bad about the Air Force right now. We don't have warrant officers in the Air Force. And we're looking at it again. I hate that. I hated it. Because I'd go over to a joint job and I'd see these people building leaders. Yeah. Leaders building leaders. <laughs> and expertise. And I was like, why doesn't the Air Force have this? And they're like, ah, it's just not something we do. I'm like, this we're missing out. We're missing out. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know. Every, I think every service model has a different structure. And the Air Force's structure is definitely different than that of the Army. And there, there's a reason for that. So. Yeah, and Bo, you and I have talked about this, and like so, leaders, if you're on, if you're listening, like let let this sink in. You are at an automatic disadvantage as a leader uh -huh. because the people closest to the problem have all the information. That's right. You as yep. a leader have all the authority, less information. They have all the information and no authority. So yep. even if you were just like a pure odds game, you're probably going to make the wrong decisions. Just because you don't have all the information. Now, would you do better if you had all the information? Like, of course. Mm -hmm. but how do we bridge that gap, right? I think that's where it comes back to like empowering them to make their own plan. They're yeah. giving yeah. feedback, just like you both said. Yep. So, Atlas, here's a piece of news. Okay. So, the Air Force announced this week, and this article published by military.com um, is actually this morning at 9-11 Eastern. The Air Force announced this week that it is bringing back warrant officer ranks. Good. But not for pilots. Yeah, no, I saw that. No, no wing wearers uh, were, were being included in that. And that's fine. Um, but it's something that's been needed for a long time. And I've always advocated for that. But, you know, my my extent of changing the whole process was was the promotion system when I was a staff surgeon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tell that story quite often. People are like, what? You did what? And uh, yeah, when I was like a kid, I used my 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 decision cycle that my mom taught me the who, what, where, when, and why yeah. I, mean, I was really fancy. I used how to, so it was like five plus one. So there's six. <laughs> things that I, so it took me two years to figure out how the promotion system was kicking out this, this list. And they used to kick it out by number. And uh, I was in charge of like taking the number and then like making it a list so that people could, I was like, why don't they just kick it out alphabetically so that we can just push it out faster. And they're like, that's a good idea we should do that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you. And they're like, well, write it up. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, I literally, I got a medal and like 300 bucks for changing the way the Air Force promotion system kicked out the promotion. And it was alpha. It's alpha. It still is now today. Yeah. It's alphabetical when it comes out, but like Amazing. it didn't come out that way. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> but back to that, like, there you go. I, I wish I had a warrant officer. I had a retired chief. It was like, hey, this is a technical problem that you need to work on. And I'm like, how? And he's like, yep. <laughs> yep, figure it out. And then <laughs> change the system. And I was like, thank you, I guess. I had nobody to like kind of guide me through. And which, man, I owned it, but it yeah. sucked. Like, I wish I had somebody. It would have went a lot smoother, a lot faster if I would have had a leader to teach me how to do the paperwork, how to communicate how to make this. Mm -hmm. Cause I went back and forth with the air force like six times over, you know, a six month period before they're like, Oh, you want it alphabetized? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, Oh, why didn't you just say that? I did. I just, I just didn't do it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a kid. <laughs> that is too funny. Yeah. But good job. Look at all yeah. the people that look at those lists today and don't know that that was yeah. uh, all because of you. That's good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, Legacy. that's right. Legacy. Um, we always give our guests an opportunity to, to, to do some shout outs, uh, promote your book. Uh, if we didn't do that enough already, um, whatever you'd like to do, let them know how they can get in touch with you. If they want to hire you for speaking, training, coaching, whatever you do, um, by all means. So right now it's the, it's the Atlas Altman show. Yeah. Um, Hey, I don't need money. That's so. good. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not trying to sell anything or any product. If I can be of service, I will work with whatever it is that you have. Um, so what I've done in the past is a lot of stages. And now I'm, I'm focused on podcasts because podcasts help more people and you don't have to pay for them. 
So yeah. if I can get people on a platform where they listen to something like this and they grab value and then they move out and become a better leader, that's where I'm at. Um, you can buy my book. I'm not trying to make money off of it. It's 99 cents. Literally been on the bestseller list for three months because it's probably 99 cents. <laughs> Maybe it's the price where I don't know. But there's a lot of good reviews that come in there about some of the things we talked about in the show. Um, and my next book's going to be Start With Who. It's I'm also going to price it low. I don't, I don't need money. I need to make a difference. And that's what's important to me. So if I can make a difference for your people, your processes, or your leaders, um, you can reach out to me. LinkedIn probably is the best way to hit me directly. Otherwise, you're going to hit one of my agents and they're going to be like, hey, uh, we're going to need some of these right here. <laughs> and, and so like, uh, I'm not about that. Um, and uh, But my agents are. So the price point there is not negotiable and it's not me. So if you want to talk to me, hit me on LinkedIn, Atlas Altman, and happy happy to talk to you. Excellent. Luke, any parting thoughts? Alice, I'm so glad we met. This is going to be the first of many conversations. Bo has been, Bo has been um, not hiding you because he's told me about <laughs> you, you know, but I'm, I'm shocked it's taken this long. So now that the secret is out, we're going to connect more. So I thanks so it, much man. for joining. Yeah. This is a hey. great kickoff to our next 100 episodes because this is oh, yeah. episode 201. Oh, so really? this is it, man. This Seriously? will be the one, Luke, that's going to take us over, Woo. take us over. A million downloads. Stop sure. it, dude. This yeah, we're at amazing. like a we're at like Atlas. We're at like nine hundred and seventy nine thousand downloads. <laughs> yeah, you're so gonna get that we're sure. gonna hit the million it's mark amazing. with this episode amazing. right here. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait to celebrate that. I can't wait. Yeah, can't us wait. Too. Awesome. Well, Bone Luke Nation, you have been listening to Atlas Altman. We thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you comment, send us feedback because just like we talked about in the episode, we want to hear from you. We want to make this a podcast that's helpful to you, to all of you. We can't do that without your feedback. We want your feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. Send it. And with that, that's a wrap.